In this video, we will cover some basic anatomy of the nervous system, causes and symptoms of neural tension in the upper extremities, testing, possible misdiagnoses, treatments, and we'll answer some questions submitted by you, our subscribers. Have you ever told someone, hey, you're getting on my nerves? Oh my god, yes. I say that to you every day. Uh-huh. Well, I'm about to get up all on those nerves again. Let's start by learning what neural tension is and what causes it in the first place. So neural tension is an abnormal physiological and mechanical response created by the nervous system when its normal range of motion or stretch capacity is limited. Lack of nerve mobility can be caused by compression from tight, swollen, or scarred surrounding tissue, and the location of this compression is some, sometimes called the entrapment site, which is why neural tension is also sometimes referred to as nerve entrapment. Now just to clarify, so like nerve entrapment can cause neural tension, but neural tension and, not, and nerve entrapment are not exactly the same thing. So to help kind of picture this, think of a string threaded through a straw. The string is your nerve and the straw is the surrounding tissue. If you pull either end of the nerve, it glides smoothly through the tissue. But if you pinch the tissue and pull the nerve again, the nerve becomes entrapped and can no longer move smoothly. The resulting pressure and tension on the nerve is, well, not appreciated, so it responds by producing symptoms as such. It can produce numbness, tingling, pain, burning, and more. The reason this is important for climbers to understand is because it can easily be misdiagnosed as tennis elbow or climber's elbow, which are two of the most common overuse pathologies in climbing. Reviewing some basic anatomy will be helpful in diagnosing which nerve is causing your issues, which we'll have tests for later in the video. And we've got all this written out in the show notes on our website to make it nice and easy for you. The three nerves to be aware of here are the median, radial, and ulnar nerve. These are the three main nerve branches that can become entrapped and cause issues for climbers and the general population. The median nerve, as it forms through the brachial plexus, is going to go more towards the inside of your arm to the inner aspect of your elbow and then down the front of your forearms and into the fingers, more so on the palmar side. The radial nerve, again, as it leaves through that brachial plexus, is going to go more towards the back side of the shoulder through the lateral component of the outside of the elbow and then down more of the thumb side and it'll be a little bit more on the back side of your hand as well. The ulnar nerve, once it passes through the shoulder, is gonna be similar to the median where it's more on the inside aspect of your, your upper arm, then passes through on the inside but posterior back side of the elbow, and then enters into the hand and stays more on the inner part of your hand towards that fourth and fifth digit. Symptoms of neural tension can be challenging to accurately identify due to the varying sensations you may experience and the location of them. They can present as mild tingling or just decreased sensation. They can also be more advanced with numbness, burning, and or pain such as like a dull ache. The symptoms may be position dependent as well, meaning they may come and go quickly with positional changes of your upper extremities. On the other hand, some symptoms can linger for longer periods of time due to unresolved compression of tissue. As for location, symptoms may present in the upper arm, but they most often occur at the elbow, wrist, or hand, so we'll focus on those. Ulnar nerve irritation may present with isolated symptoms by the inside of your elbow, on the inside of your wrist, or to your fourth and fifth digits, or like the ring finger and the pinky. But it's also possible to have symptoms at all three locations simultaneously. The same is true for the radial and median nerve. The radial nerve may cause symptoms on the outside of your elbow and can travel down the outside of your forearm to your wrist and into your thumb and possibly the back side of your hand and that index finger. The median nerve may present with symptoms on the inside or kind of the front part of your elbow and forearm and it may travel down the forearm and into the palms and your fingers. The exact location of symptoms may vary slightly from person to person as everyone's nerve distribution can vary slightly. However, the general path we described is accurate for most cases and variances will be pretty subtle. All right, so now that we're familiar with the symptoms, let's take a look at the tests we're gonna use to diagnose neural tension. Diagnosing neural tension is primarily done through neural tension testing. Wow, what would we do without you? Thank you. <laughs> 
The testing evaluates the length and mobility of the nervous system with progressively increasing amounts of tension on specific nerves, reproducing symptoms in a controlled manner. This progression is achieved by specific movements in the five locations that may develop upper extremity neural tension, the neck, shoulders, elbow, wrist, and fingers. So we're gonna talk about each test in a second, but first we need to understand the three important rules of neural tension testing. Okay, rule number one of neural tension testing, you should always do this on your unaffected side first in order to create a baseline. Why? Because many of you may find you have some level of neural tension. In fact, studies have shown a majority of people have a positive first tension test for the median nerve. This doesn't mean that most of the population has a dysfunction of their nervous system, it is just our normal anatomy. So rule number one, a true positive tension test only occurs if the effective arm has greater or more intense symptoms than the unaffected arm. Now, rule number two is equally important. A neural tension test is only positive if it recreates or exacerbates the approximate symptoms that led you to the test in the first place. Say you wanna find out why you have that pain on the outside of your elbow. You do the neural tension test and one of them causes some tingling in your thumb. That is not a positive test for your symptoms as it did not recreate or exacerbate your outer elbow pain or something very similar to it. You may have some mild neural tension, but that is not likely the cause of your elbow pain in this instance. Finally, bonus rule number three, and this is really more of a suggestion, do these tests in the order I am presenting. Again, the point is not to aggravate your nerves too greatly, but rather to recreate symptoms in a controlled manner. Don't rush the tests. If you start to recreate your symptoms, you can stop right there. You don't need to create further tension on the nerve as that may just create further irritation. All right, so on to the tests. Okay, so the first test we'll talk about is the upper limb tension test one, which is for the median nerve. The first step is shoulder girdle depression, which is the exact opposite of shrugging the shoulder, so keep that shoulder down. The next step is shoulder abduction, so you're gonna raise your arm out to the side. After you do this, you'll likely need to depress your shoulder again because you may have shrugged it up as you raise it out to the side. Next, you're gonna rotate your shoulder externally, basically until your fist is up to the sky. Then you will supinate your palm or your forearm so your palm is facing up towards the sky. Then you will extend your wrist and fingers as if you're trying to point them to the ground and you will extend or straighten your elbow. This is where most people will start to feel some symptoms but if you do not, then you can do cervical side flexion. If you move your head away from the testing shoulder, it should cause more symptoms. Moving your head towards the testing shoulder should relieve symptoms. Now do this whole process slowly. We don't want to stretch the nerve too hard if there is tension already present. So if you felt it without having to move the head, you do not need to move the head. In fact, I would rather just suggest move the head towards that side to see if it does release the symptoms or reduce them. Upper limb tension test number two is also for the median nerve, but the difference is basically gonna be your arm is gonna be by your side. So you'll still have that shoulder girdle depression, you will have your elbow straight, you'll have the arm rotated out and your forearm supinated, your wrist and fingers will extend, and then you will do your, your cervical or your head test. And again, moving your head towards the shoulder or the testing side should relieve the symptoms and moving your head away should create more symptoms. Upper limb tension test number three is for the radial nerve. It will be very similar to the upper limb tension test number two for the median nerve, except instead of externally rotating your arm, you will internally rotate your arm until your palm or thumb is pointing backwards. And then instead of extending your wrist and fingers, you will flex your wrist and fingers. The final test is upper limb tension test four, which is for the ulnar nerve. Now this test shares more similarities with upper limb tension test one for the median nerve as our arm will be elevated out to the side. So you will still have that shoulder girdle depression. You will still have the shoulder abduction and shoulder external rotation. And also you'll have wrist and finger extension, but you'll have elbow flexion rather than elbow extension. So I like to think of this one kind of as carrying a tray or a pizza carry. Quick disclaimer. 
This video is not meant to diagnose or treat thoracic outlet syndrome, cervical radiculopathy, or carpal tunnel syndrome. Those are very different nerve-related issues. However, if you're unsure what pathology you're dealing with, it is safe to perform the tests in this video to help determine whether or not the nerve entrapment applies to you. Okay, so if you follow the testing guidelines and are positive for any of the upper limb tension tests, you can go in even more depth by isolating different steps in the test to see if one causes more symptoms than another. So what happens if there are multiple sites that are equal? What if the hand, the elbow, and the shoulder movements all recreated symptoms equally? Well, it could be that you have multiple entrapment sites, you just have a slight shortening of the nerves, or it could just be that where you're feeling the pain is entrapping the nerve enough to create symptoms regardless of where the movement is coming from. No matter what though, you'll be able to overcome these issues with the treatments we're gonna talk about in just a bit. But before we get to treatment, let's talk about one of the most important sections, one of the main reasons you're drawn into this video, misdiagnosis. Boring. It would be cool, I swear. Distinguishing between neural tension and climbers or tennis elbow is difficult because of the similarities in location of symptoms and the symptoms themselves. Climber's elbow causes pain at the medial elbow, and sometimes when the symptoms are bad, it can be in the anterior forearm as it follows the muscles of the wrist and finger flexors. Median nerve entrapment also causes pain at the medial elbow, and also when irritated can cause symptoms down into the anterior forearm. <laughs> Tennis elbow causes pain at the lateral elbow and when irritated can cause symptoms under the back side of your forearm. I'll let you guess what I'm going to say next about radial nerve entrapment. Okay, fine, no guessing. It can also cause pain in those exact same locations. So what do we do now? Well, for one, nerve issues are more likely to produce radicular or traveling pain. So if you have pain that travels all the way down into the hand, there's a hint that it might be a nerve to blame. Other than that, Sometimes you have to use your treatment as your diagnostic tool. So check this out. If you aren't positive that you have neural tension, but you do some neural tension treatment exercises and you start to feel better, that treatment just became your tool. Treating neural tension will not fix tennis elbow or climber's elbow. So you likely had neural tension all along. If you feel completely lost at this point, or just don't want to do all this testing and diagnosis on your own, I highly recommend seeing a PT, MD, or even a neurologist if your symptoms are bad enough. All right, now shameless plug, but if you do want to see a PT but you don't know any or you're not confident in them, you can always book a private session with me because if you're here, you're obviously confident in me, so you can find that information on our website. <laughs> Who's want to book a private session with you? Hey, wait, like you just booked a private session Now on the other hand, if you feel confident you have neural tension at this point, or you're ready to use neural tension treatment as a diagnostic tool, then you're ready for the next section. When it comes to treating neural tension, there are two primary and a few secondary forms of treatment. The two primary forms of treatment focus on improving neural mobility. This is accomplished with nerve gliding and nerve tensioning. Nerve gliding is just like it sounds. You're gliding the nerve through its pathway to help reduce any possible adhesions, sites of entrapment, etc. This is also referred to as nerve flossing. With nerve gliding, you pull one end of the nerve while relaxing the other, and then vice versa. Nerve gliding smooths out internal surfaces, breaking up any scar tissue or sites of entrapment, so the more you do it, the smoother the nerve's pathway becomes. This is a non-aggressive form of treatment as it does not create tension on the nerve if done correctly. To perform a nerve glide, you'll go through a similar process to your testing, but instead of moving your head away from the test side, you'll move it towards. There are two median nerve glides. Choosing which median nerve glide you do is about which one felt more positive with your initial testing. It is okay though to try both and see which form of treatment feels better to you. Nerve gliding has actually been studied in cadavers and is shown to create movement of the nerve throughout its entire pathway. It is effective and the reason I mention that is because with nerve gliding you should feel nothing. This can be confusing because we usually expect to feel something when we perform an exercise or treatment, even if it's just dull or burn or some tension. But rest assured that even when you may feel nothing, that is exactly what we want. I usually say start with one set of 10 glides with no hold at the end of the movement. Remember, you're pulling the string back and forth through the straw, so to speak. So you don't need to pause and hold for a long time on either end. 
You can do this two times a day initially, and then if you find it beneficial at the first couple of days, you can increase up to three times a day. Now, if you don't find nerve gliding to be effective after the first week or so, it's time to move on to the next primary treatment, nerve tensioning. All right, so nerve tensioning is also just like it sounds. You create tension or stretch on the nerve. This should be your second step, not the first. Nerve gliding is the non-aggressive version, whereas nerve tensioning can be more aggressive. The reason this is more aggressive is because nerves simply don't love being stretched. Nerve tensioning is meant to aggressively mobilize your neural network and attempt to improve mobility while reducing adhesions. To perform nerve tensioning, you simply do one thing opposite. You switch the head movement. So you'd move it away when you normally move it towards, or you move it towards when you normally move it away. With most stretches we do to our skeletal structure, we'll often hold for 15, 30, 60 seconds in certain positions without any issues. That's not so much with nerve tensioning. The maximum time we want to hold a nerve tension stretch is five seconds. So unlike nerve gliding, you will feel this. So be more cautious as there's a chance you can cause a temporary increase in symptoms if you go too hard too quickly. You may even cause a small setback by irritating the nerve. For this reason, I recommend starting with only one set of six reps, holding for four seconds, and if this feels benef like it's benefiting you or reducing your symptoms, you can increase it to 10 reps and maybe multiple sets a day. But again, don't be too aggressive as this is a more aggressive form of treatment. You do not want to overly irritate the nerve. Secondary forms of treatment include mobilizing the tissues that surround the affected nerve's pathway and or it's like the entrapment site. This can be done with massage or instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, decompression like with cupping or simply by stretching. Mobilizing the tissue in this way can relieve compression on the nerve or simply break up any adhesions that are affecting it, which can release the tension and reduce or eliminate your symptoms. These secondary forms of treatment can really be done anytime as long as you know how to do them properly. If you don't, do some research first or ask an expert for help. And that's it for neural tension treatment. Now that we know what to do, let's check our prognosis. Oh my God, we're almost there. Prognosis is actually fairly good with nerve entrapment. You could see changes pretty quickly if you're imp implementing the right treatment. If neural gliding is gonna benefit you, you'll know in as little as a day or at most two weeks. If nerve tensioning is the way for you, same timeline. However, it may take quite a bit longer to fully recover and that timeline will vary from person to person. Could be a couple weeks, could be eight. Oftentimes, simply mobilizing the neural network or identifying and mobilizing the tissue that is causing the entrapment will be sufficient. The only problem with neural tension is that you can't really lengthen your nerves, so you'll have to like, likely monitor um, and continue to do these and be diligent with it in the future to make sure your neuromobility stays good. Because even if you feel fully healed, there's a chance it can return, which may mean continue to do your like flossing like once a week or so and stay consistent with whatever stretches were effective. But if you stay on top of it, you can definitely resolve the symptoms and keep them away. Viewer question time. I like that you guys are submitting these questions to me on Instagram now. It's kind of fun. I like this section. Good work. Thank you. I don't know. I think this is Emil's idea. Oh, it was definitely, if it was good, it was probably my idea. Oh, I did it then, because it's uh, terrible. Oh, I lied. Yeah, I set it. you up. Entrapment! Ha! <laughs> Got me. All right, so is it safe to climb with this? If you have major symptoms, I don't recommend it. Otherwise, yes, you are safe to climb if you have mild neural tension. Is neural tension dangerous? Neural tension can lead to long-term issues, but typically it does not. Um, if it goes untreated, it can cause more pain, discomfort, and it can cause decreased function to the point where some people will have to seek professional help before it gets too bad, but generally it's not dangerous. What do I do if I do these treatments and the symptoms don't go away? First, self-evaluation may not be working and you may need to go see a professional to really diagnose your issues. Second, there's always a possibility that it is multifactorial. You may have a tendinopathy that will cause the entrapment of the nerve and you may need to rehab that tendinopathy before the nerve issue will resolve. This can be especially true if it is an entrapment from the pronator teres. This is oftentimes weak in people and the weakness can cause tightness, tightness can cause entrapment. So we may need to strengthen and lengthen the pronator teres before the nerve issues will resolve. Again, this may point back to step one, you may need to see a professional for an evaluation. 
Can it lead to other issues if left untreated? I mean, certainly. It can lead to more intense neural symptoms, including numbness and tingling, and eventually can lead to loss of strength. And if there's lots of strength, it can cause compensations, and compensations can cause subsequent injuries and other muscles that are related to those compensations. Can it go away on its own without any treatment? I mean, if it's mild, yeah. If it's just a mild tendinopathy that causes swelling, once the swelling goes down, then the tension may go away. The body wants to heal itself, so it will try to, regardless of what you do sometimes. But we can guide that process to make sure it does heal and does heal quickly. If you hurt a nerve once, will it become a chronic issue for you? Not necessarily, no. I have had radial nerve entrapment, but it was related to a bout of like lateral elbow pain as well, and I treated both, and they went away. I've also worked with climbers who have had acute issues with this, like both median and radial nerve. It went away and it stayed away just with some light, continued neuromobility work. Should you do nerve glides before loading the tendons? I mean, so if you have a history of neural tension, it's a fine addition to your warm up to do a set of nerve glides, um, but it won't, so it won't hurt anything. Is it bad to sleep on your side if you have nerve pain? Unfortunately, the answer is it depends. If the entrapment's in your shoulder and like you sleep kind of weird on your shoulder on your side, then yeah, it can cause issues. And then again, like if it's in your elbow, sleeping on your side may be fine because you may not be getting that entrapment or the pressure if your elbow is not fully flexed all night. Every so often I get an electrical feeling in my right arm slash elbow. Am I broken? Is it related to activity? Because if so, it may just be like you're trying really hard, activating those muscles, and that activation could be causing the compression, which causes your like tingling or electrical sensation. Can neural mobs reduce muscle spasms in my shoulder associated with Gaston slash lockoffs? Possibly. I mean, especially with the lock-off, it may be compressing your brachial plexus, but it could also just be the strain or stress in the position of your shoulder if you don't have the proper strength to do so. How do I stop nerve pain from the top of my neck to my shoulder and down my arm? That kind of sounds like more of either a muscle issue or a muscle plus nerve issue, or even like a cervical issue, such as a cervical radiculopathy. Ask your physician for a referral to physical therapy and see if they can help. Sometimes it's hard to track what's working and what's not, but if you write it down, you'll get a clearer picture. And above all, remember, your body wants to heal, you just need to guide it to success. If you don't feel comfortable being that guide on your own, go see a professional. That's what we're here for. Until next time, train, keep your nerves mobile, climb, don't let other tissues put pressure on them. Send, watch super long technical videos on neural tension that took 50 hours to make but only get like 20 likes. Repeat. All right, well, I'm gonna read it. Yeah, fine, do it. Fine. Ready? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do it. Fine, let's do it. So to help understand this, think of a straw threaded through a string. I feel like I'm just going over energy to make sure that you don't say <laughs> more energy. 65 videos later, <laughs> figuring it out. This light is bright. <laughs> Shield me. And once we've got all this written out, and we've got it, gosh, I'm screwing it up. The median nerve has, th uh, okay. So the median nerve, as it, <laughs> I can't tell if, I'm just doing better, or if you're just tired, because I feel like you're not correcting me as much. No, I just think you're doing good. <laughs> I haven't had any issues. I know. Believe me, I would tell you. <laughs> okay, good. All right, that's why I'm like, no, I, I can't be doing good. He must just be tired or something. <laughs> I added an unnecessary the in there, but I think we're okay. Same location to make things even more compli complicated. <laughs> www.hoopersbeta.com slash power review session. <laughs> wow. That was so long. Dude, say something cool so they like the videos and subscribe for more awesome content. Um, like and subscribe for more super sweet vids, y'all. So lame, dude. So lame. I thought it was pretty good.